science is, is transforming special physics, enabling precise reservoir characterization and production optimization. Through advanced algorithms and analytics, data science enhances well log interpretation, uh, it predicts porosity, and maximizes hydrocaloric recovery. This fusion of disciplines drives efficiency and unlocks new frontiers in, er in energy exploration. Today, we are delighted back, Ms. Nisreen Bendele Amor, as our, as our distinguished league guest, and this time as a valuable speaker. Miss, do you want to introduce yourself, or do you want me to do it? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Or you can introduce me, no problem. <laughs> okay, okay. So, as I said, Ms. Nisreen Amor has been working as a special physicist for SLB Digital and Integration North Africa with an integrated knowledge of wireline data acquisition, acoustics, and petrophysics. She has led and contributed to numerous client assignments in her 15 years career within SLB, including two years as a wireline field engineer. She is now looking after the development of special technical experts in SLB. She holds a chemical engineering or refining degree from the University of Bumardas, Algeria in 27. Uh, yeah, in 27. So, Miss, thank you for being here today. Thank you for the introduction and for the invite. It's a pleasure uh, to share with you some insights on this interesting topic. Just to uh, check with you, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. OK, so this is the first slide. So yeah, so it's meant really to be an uh, inter interactive discussion about the, uh, yeah, you called it data science application in petrophysics. I would really uh, mostly talk about uh, machine learning application in petrophysics. Um, and in all the, um, let's say, the different domains, different disciplines that are uh, uh, related to reservoir characterization, um, uh, formation evaluation, exploration, be it petrophysics, geology, geophysics, geophysics, we are seeing more and more advances. Uh, on that side, because the capabilities are huge, and that's where like the future, most of the future developments uh, are in. So it's just to give you some insight. I'm not a data science specialist, so I will not go into details of the models building and everything. Really, the objectives is to give you an overview of what is being done on petrophysics. Uh, by using uh, machine learning capabilities, and we can discuss on this. Uh, so just a note, um, data science is very wide, and then inside data science, we have artificial intelligence. So we are, um, let's say, using uh, machines uh, to uh, try to get them a little bit as intelligent as, uh, as a human being. Uh, inside that huge domain as well, uh, which is artificial intelligence, we have machine learning. So we are here, we are training, training the machines to learn something similar to how, a bit similar, it, it, we, we are not reaching how the human beings are, uh, are learning, but we are trying to um, mimic how the brain is uh, learning from experience, from examples, and we are trying to tra train the machines to learn, yeah, and with enhancement on um, cap power um, computing capabilities, so this will help us a lot to gain in efficiency, and this one of the main objective of using this uh, machine learning and then inside machine learning i know you you're hearing about uh, also uh, uh, deep learning which is a subset of uh, machine learning yeah uh, so since the attendance is not very uh, very numerous uh, if you have any question at any time you can interrupt me i don't have so many slides so it's really it will be really good to uh, to to be like a discussion huh? 
So if anything I say, even if it's on petrophysics, even if it you, you may think that it's something that you should know and you don't know or you don't understand, please feel free to, to interrupt me and I can uh, give some, uh, some explanation if, if I can. So we will be talking about machine learning. A generic workflow on how we do that, uh, as we said, we are trying to train the machine to give us uh, to learn about, uh, to learn um, from something, good examples that we give it, and then to uh, apply it to something and predict and give us results faster than, than what we can uh, ourselves do manually or uh, one by one because we know that it will be faster. So that's the main objective. So how we do that? The, the generic workflow of doing that in machine learning is to take raw data data that we have, right? It can be, for example, in our petrophysics example uh, case, generally it's log data, right? Um, measurements from uh, log acquired data, either from wireline or uh, login wide drilling, we take them. It goes uh, through some preparation. Uh, we make sure that uh, it's not uh, repeated, that the data that we are using are um, well suited for the results and the objective that we want to achieve, right? We are not just feeding data to feed data. We will have to um, to keep the objective in perspective. So this goes uh, under the preparation of data. And then um, we will have the step where we will split the data uh, between training uh, data sets and testing data sets. And then, for example, the, the percentage of the, this split will, uh, will depend. Uh, we can choose, and sometimes, for example, we take 80% for training, 20% for testing, or we can do the 50-50. It, it will depend on the person doing it. And then we can, um, um, we can decide based on the, on the case and the objective and the type of data and the number and the, the size of the data. So we will split the data that we have. For example, we will have, we'll see some examples. We'll have, uh, for example, uh, logs, raw data, and then we will have results. For example, saturation porosity uh, from different wells. And then, for example, we will have 15 wells. We will split, split split this 15 wells. For example, 10 wells, we will take everything from those 10 wells the logs and the results, the petrophysical parameters. We will train the model on those 10 wells. We will keep the five wells where we have both the logs and the results. We will not use them to train the model. We will not, we'll not give the model this test data, right? We'll train the model, um, adjust the parameters, see the results, Right, and then we will test on the five wells that we kept from the beginning, right? And then there we will evaluate if the model is giving us good results when we when we compare, for example, the porosity that is uh, predicted versus the porosity that we have, and we should be confident, should be good ones that we are using for the train and the test. Huh? Uh, if we assess that the model is good. Okay, so we will uh, use this model to predict on new data, completely new data. And, uh, and this is our uh, machine learning uh, model uh, ready to be used. So this is the generic workflow. So let's start uh, looking at some examples from real life. Any questions so far? No, so I, I will I will keep uh, going. But in case there is, there is any question later, uh, we can address. So I will show some example of machine learning application for well low log normalization. Uh, let me first explain what I mean by by log uh, normalization. Right, um, you know the measurements. Um, be it from wireline or from 
uh, login while drilling is a sum of um, different inputs, let's say. It's uh, affected by um, three main factors. We have the formation signal, so the signal that it's coming from the formation, and that's what we want to, to uh, evaluate, right? We want to know what is formation made of, what is the porosity, what is the lithology, etc. And then we have the random noise, right? Because we are acquiring data in some environments. We have the wet, we have the mud, we have the, uh, all the noise surrounding, right? And then we have this systematic error, right? Systematic error can be a lot of things. Can be due to bad calibration of the tool some malfunctions, some human error while setting the parameters, some uh, inherent error into either the acquisition system or the tool itself or anything in the environment uh, that is not accounted for. So this is the part that we are trying usually when we have a formation evaluation. So when a petrophysicist is asked to um, do a formation evaluation, a petrophysical analysis uh, of um, a formation of a reservoir, and especially when it's um, related to multi-well, so we'll have different wells, several wells in, in uh, the context of uh, a project, for example. We want to evaluate a reservoir throughout the a field, for example, we have several wells. Um, and we will uh, see that from the different well logs, we'll see a difference. This difference should, we would like it to be only related to formations and reservoir properties and porosities and potential, not related to systematic error. Because if it's these changes and difference will, will, are related to this one, all our evaluation will be biased because we will think that two uh, reservoirs are different because one is more interesting, more one has more potential than another, but it's not the case. So that's why we go through uh, log normalization, especially when we are doing multi-well analysis, right? This is a very heavy process. It's a very long process, and it's only in the beginning of the formation evaluation, especially when we have a high number of wells. Uh, we need to display all the wells, logs, look at them manually, load the data, and then decide on how we will normalize. So just one example, just to give you some um, uh, some graphical example of this case. For example, we see is this um, in this track, we have the first track on the right, is a, a gamma ray, right? Which is, let's say, affected because the one of the wells are uh, not vertical, right? So the acquisition environment itself is affecting the log response. So this is not really the gamma ray, that we would see in a, a vertical well. So this measurement is affected by the, um, the the setting of the well, let's say, right? And here we have the, um, let's say, the ground truth gamma ray for this particular uh, interval. We can see the difference. So here we are uh, displaying it, displaying them in the same track, right? If we take them as, as they are, so for these different wells, for example, the shear volume that we will uh, be um, um, computing, let's say, right, estimating, will be different. And we will think, for example, that this one in, uh, in green, the lateral one, will be more shaly, but it's not the case. It's just that the, the gamma ray is affected, right? So one aim of the normalization is to uh, bring them together right, to be able to compare apple to apple. So after the normalization, we'll have um, gamma ray between wells that are comparable. And whenever we have a difference, we will know that it's really related to the formation difference. So this is just to give you uh, an understanding of the normalization. So this is a, a classic workflow, right? 
we used to do it manually. We go over all the all the logs uh, over different wells. One uh, other cause of the difference between the uh, log responses could be different service companies. For example, logs acquired from SLB, some other logs acquired from uh, other competitors, from Baker Hugh or Halliburton. So different setting parameters, different physics of measurements of the different tools. So it could cause different in measurement. Here, for example, we can plot the different, for example, density uh, of multi-well data. And we see here that we see that the data is shifted, right? We can we can feel that this is something that is not natural, especially if we are looking at the same like geological setting. We're uh, expecting that it should be uh, close, right? These different wells are covering um, same formations. It should be that different. It should not be. So this is before normalization. This is after normalization. And here we can see that the normalization is very important step before starting the formation evaluation. Uh, so here, uh, what they've done in this uh, paper that I'm uh, referring to is that um, uh, they compared, let's say, they saw that the manual uh, workflow for well normalization is taking a lot of time and effort from the from the geoscientists, right? So they tried to uh, apply machine learning model uh, for well log normalization. The manual uh, workflow is uh, here, displayed here. Uh, as I said, review all relevant uh, logs. Uh, what we need to do, because uh, we cannot compare just by comparing. Uh, we see that this is higher than this. Or we say, let's say we will go and normalize that they will be the same. How we will know that this is a systematic error and not formation difference? So this is the really the tricky part, right? Um, so in ideal cases, uh, we will have a zone where we will know the... Um, the correct log response that we should expect over that zone. In that particular example, they had a zero PU, so zero porosity limestone, um, as pure as possible, right? Very tight limestone. So we know the um, correct response for density and for neutron, for example, right? And we know that on compatible scales, neutron and density should overlay on that particular um, unit of reference of zero PU tight limestone. So this was used as a unit of reference. So if we go and do it manually, so we need to locate it under different wells, use that as unit of reference, um, but before that, um, of course, we need to review QC, all the logs and display, right? Compare between the wells. And then uh, when we have this unit of reference, we need to shift all the logs to the known values where the re reference unit exists. So all the wells we have, the reference unit, we say, for example, this is the zero PO limestone um, porosity, neutron, uh, if it's calibrated on limestone, should read zero PU. If it's not reading zero PU, let's offset it. And we apply the offset, right? Is that? And then this offset will be applied on the whole section because why it's not reading zero offset? We are supposed to, uh, we think that it's because of systematic error, right? So that's how we normalize based on unit of reference. We shift the logs to known values. And then if some wells are not going through this, this uh, zero PU limestone zone, we need to define another uh, reference unit. Yeah, some tight spot that we know they are zero porosity. Uh, we'll use that for the, for the other wells and do the same workflows. So this is very uh, dependent on user input right human uh, intervention and it's very time consuming 
So the people who wrote the the, the paper that I'm mentioning below, right? Uh, what they've done. They used the machine learning model. They they trained it on some wells, some reference wells, right? Covering reference units uh, based on the same that we uh, that we said, like unit when we know the log responses, um, and the boundaries and the selection of the wells are still done by the geoscientists. Huh? The machine learning model will not build itself by itself. So for in the in the beginning, the knowledge of the geoscientist is very, very, very important because they will, for example, in this case, the geoscientist, the petrophysicist will define the reference wells, like the wells with good quality data, the Zarkovli in other sections that can be used to uh, train the model, and the reference unit uh, will be provided by the petrophysicist. And then we will build the model uh, using the log data from reference wells. Um, and taking the response in the reference unit, right, to predict the desired logs. So we have the logs on that reference uh, wells. The model will learn from this response, ideal good responses. They, the, the model will be based on that. We will build a model that will be able to predict when we compare it to the good logs it will be uh, as close as possible to, to this log response, right? And then we go and predict the density of neutron in wells, in, in the other wells, not the reference ones. And the model will provide us also with the normalization constants that we will apply for normalization. So no need anymore to uh, for someone who is setting parameters, trying offsets uh, to match that reference unit's uh, reading and apply it in the in the in the other intervals and the other well, uh, wells. Uh, so this on the left you see an example. So this is a log display. You have a gamma ray, uh, PEF, caliper, density neutron. So this is uh, like the raw data before anything before any normalization. Uh, so this is in limestone uh, compatible scale. So we are displaying density and neutron, porosity, right? Um, and then we have the deep resistivity. And then on the, on the right, this first track is the um, machine learning uh, normalized logs, density and neutron. And then uh, we have the, uh, let's say, uh, in this uh, case, what they've done, they um, took the results from a normalization done by an expert, right, which is taken as, uh, let's say, uh, a reference. So, humanly done uh, normalization, right? Uh, we see that overall, they are not very far from each other, right? Uh, these zones, a and B, these are the, the references. B is the main reference, right? Uh, as you see here, is a ve quite very clean uh, gamma ray. So this is the zero PU limestone. But we have, as we have in reality, it's, it will not be the full interval with pure limestone, uh, no other uh, minerals in there. So we'll see, we see that we have some... Uh, some uh, layers that we have something else. And this is, let's say, this is other advantage of the model because uh, one thing that the, the model will provide is the, is the clusters, right? It, it, they will, they, the, the model will classify the different intervals and we will give classes, right? And from this classification, so sort of from looking at it, we can see that uh, for example, this interval is different than the one here, right? So this one is very, very low gamma ray. This is really where really pure limestone is expected, right? And where we will expect really, really the perfect overlay between density and neutron on the zero porosity. And same here, for example.
And this is achieved in the machine learning uh, based normalization. Whereas when we do it manually, we don't have that precision because uh, due to time, if the petrophysicist has 100 wells to do, they will not really go into details. Uh, and uh, maybe they will take this zone as a whole, as a whole uh, or small zone and then apply or take the other one and apply it, whereas we see that uh, it has some different classes, so different interval based on the, um, on the log response. So we see that if we look at this, we can, uh, we can see that the machine learning based approach is more, uh, let's say, close to reality because from, from, uh, from seeing, looking at the, at the logs, uh, we can see, we kind of see that this makes more sense than this one, right? This is really perfectly overlying. Resistivity is very high because of the tightness, it's zero porosity. Gamma ray is very low. So this is really making sense, more sense. Difference is not huge, but it's, we see that it's reliable. And in terms of time, it does not take more time than, uh, than the manual thing, on the contrary. So this is really the, uh, the aim of it. Uh, this is another example for the same case. Uh, so they apply it to different wells. So, for example, this specific well did not have the the B interval, right? Where the calibration should be, right? And same same thing, it got calibrated and it took into account the model took into account the different interval through the classification. Uh, just to note, for the classification, how the model was building and classifying clustering is by using the, all the different well log, logs, well logs. And for example, if for the case where we were trying to uh, normalize and predict density, we took all the other logs, gamma ray, uh, neutron uh, deep resistivity for that case, right? And uh, for the, um, in case of neutron, we took the others. And that's how the model uh, could classify the, the different uh, formation, let's say. Yeah. And from this, we got the normalization constant. We applied them to the other wells, and the results were, were uh, quite good. So the advantage in that case is gain of time. Uh, the independency, let's say, on the manual, less dependent on the manual inputs. So the really important thing is the beginning, like the manual and the domain expertise in the beginning to set up everything, yes. Also at the end to validate and check. But through the process, less manual inputs than the classical way of doing it. And accuracy was very good as well. So this was an example for log normalization. I hope that this was clear. If any question, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Otherwise, I will go to example number two. Just checking, you're still with me, right? Because I'm not hearing anything. Yeah, yeah, we're with you, miss. OK, OK, good. So this. Another example of uh, log outlier detection and reconstruction, right? We, here, what they used, they used a machine learning workflow to detect the log outlier. In that per particular case, it, um, this is a particular case uh, because the objective was not really petrophysical evaluation. It was related to petrophysics, but it, it was really for... Um, uh, seismic characterization, right? Uh, so they needed the logs that they needed um, was the mainly density and sonic, but the uh, the accuracy and the reliability of petrophysical data was very important. So what they were doing, so they uh, first 
and uh, every time the first uh, the first step is to scan the data for consistency and create additional future in, as necessary right while analyzing the data and then um, uh, we need to identify outlier right not to take them into account when um, when reconstructing because the the final goal in that case is to reconstruct the data because as you know uh, for um, for geophysical application you know we we need ideally uh, all the log data especially density and sonic uh, throughout all the well uh, the, the full section of the well right but sometimes, for example, either the acquisition has some gaps because for formation for petrophysics, usually we just uh, concentrate on the reservoir section, right? And sometimes between uh, between runs, between section, we have some gaps, so no data there. Sometimes it's affected by casing in some section, by bad hole, right? Uh, so that's where the reconstruction was needed, right? To have all this uh, continuous logs to be used for further uh, for further uh, process uh, but then to reconstruct we needed not to base our model to uh, data that is not reliable so inside that huge data from multi well as well in this case uh, we knew we had some data that we could not rely on to build the model and reconstruct from it so first important step was to identify the outlier, the bad data, the data that are not representative. So this is uh, like the different steps and the different parameters tuning, right, for the model to identify the uh, outliers. We see the plot from the uh, Sonic. So if uh, we would take all the data as good and no outlier, fraction of outlier uh, is zero here, we would take everything, but this is not uh, this is not right the right thing to do. Uh, and then with tuning the parameter, we arrive at the uh, right fraction, right uh, where we really um, uh, exclude the bad data, bad data. For example, this is very high density. Uh, very low density, sorry, uh, which is related to bad hole, right? Uh, we have some very low sonic, for example, might be uh, due uh, to casing, for example, right? So this is um, this is the um, the process that was used to identify the, the outlier, uh, outlier, right? And then on the log display, uh, the model will generate a flag, right, to show where the data was uh, excluded right the outlier that we saw it can be used also for example later for uh, um, uh, when doing petrophysical analysis to exclude these ones um, or to flag them as a high uncertainty uh, to compute a high uncertainty on this uh, on these intervals right so for example we see here that this flag are uh, corresponding to where the caliper is showing bad hole, here as well, and here where we have very high neutron um, and uh, some peaks in density which are not uh, corresponding to any of the readings of the different logs, right? Uh, so this is uh, an example from one well. And then, <coughs> and then <coughs> using, sorry, sorry. <coughs> Then after the outlier and identification, uh, another step in this study was to uh, group the wells because it were they were uh, very um, <clears throat> spread in a very wide, um, uh, let's say, area, right? Uh, so we could not use one uh, prediction and reconstruction model for all the wells because the formation geological settings were different. So what they said is this clustering, depending on the data that we have, so we did uh, have a well grouping uh, based on petrophysical similarity after the outlier were excluded, right? And then for each group, 
a specific model was, was built to reconstruct the data uh, wherever it was not present or uh, it was affected, so considered as an outlier, right? Uh, so this is an example. Uh, so for example here, so in this track, so the first track is gamma ray, and then we have caliper compared to bit size. And then we have the heat density. In orange, we have the original one, right? The acquired one. In uh, black, we have the uh, density, uh, let's say, manually edited and reconstructed, right, by an expert. And in red, uh, we had the, um, the density reconstructed by the model, by the, uh, the ML model, right? Uh, because we needed some examples of reconstructed rocks uh, validated by uh, human eye and expert and domain expert to be able to validate the model. Because anyway, the model will give us some results, but we would not know if it's good or not. Um, so this is a comparison. We see that uh, density uh, measured is very far from the two uh, because of the bad hole, which is understandable. But the two are very close, so which gives confidence to the ML one, to the machine learning uh, model. Right. Uh, this is just the uncertainty of the model. And this is for density, and the same is for sonic. We see that the sonic is less affected, which is normal because it has a higher depth of investigation than density. So this makes sense. And we see that the one done by the expert and one done by the model are very close, which gives confidence uh, to the uh, reconstructed model. So we saw example of application log normalization. We saw in the um, uh, detecting the outlier and reconstructing. So this is really uh, we're going through the workflow of petrophysical evaluation. Now we see that, uh, especially when we are dealing with multi well analysis, what we do is. Uh, uh, we make sure that the data are comparable and we can use them in a single uh, multi-well model so we normalize, right? But before that, um, we make sure that the quality is there and uh, if any bad affected the data that can affect the results and the model afterward, we, we need to exclude that from the analysis and if possible, to avoid having missing intervals or intervals without interpretation or gaps, discontinuous data, uh, when possible, we would go with the reconstruction. But we need to be uh, confident with the, with how we do it, not just drawing the wiggles and locks and saying that we are just manually editing the locks. Um, so we saw that for both steps and both uh, important steps that are, let's say, very important in the petrophysical evaluation, machine learning is offering a lot of capabilities to make sure that we, we do it um, consistently, right, uh, in a consistent manner, right, and uh, more effectively, because the gain in time is very, very considerable, especially when we have a high number of wells. So now we will see an example of using ML really to automate the log interpretation. So we are going a level, uh, another level to the to the application. So this is uh, this is taken from uh, also a SPE paper. So if you have um, access to those nice paper, go and look and you will have a lot of details um, and then some reference. It's very good written for you. Um, so this is uh, a present representation of the uh, log interpretation workflow. So how we will, how we deal with it and how we build uh, the uh, machine learning prediction of the petrophysical output. So in this example, in this case, what we are 
trying to do is to take the logs, train the model to give us petrophysical properties and uh, to run it and to have it like automated. So for example, we do it with one or two wells, train, right? This is the one. So we have uh, some uh, logs acquired, right? We have some domain expert that is doing the domain interpretation, which ca can be considered as a ground truth, right? Ground truth interpreted logs. We train the model based on that. We give the model the logs and the petrophysical parameters. Um, the additional things that in this uh, in this paper uh, they are adding is uh, the auto the capabilities of auto tuning the hyperparameter. Hyperparameter. I will not go into details. And uh, uh, but just it's just tuning parameters of the machine learning model, right? Uh, that usually uh, someone who doesn't know anything about data science or coding or uh, uh, artificial intelligence will not really understand. It needs some understanding of this uh, of this uh, domain. So to tune and understand these parameters can be tricky for someone just uh, used to deal with the domain um, expertise. So this, in this case, what they are uh, doing is they are auto-tuning. So uh, enabling the model to auto-tune those parameters to uh, exclude manual intervention, the need of manual tuning of those, uh, of those parameters, which is very, very nice, right? Um, so then, uh, as I said, so we have the logs, we have the petrophysical evaluation from the experts uh, over selected wells. We pick few for the training, right? As we said, for the learning, we train the model and we keep some for testing, right? Uh, and then once we are happy with the model, using the learning data set, we test it on the, uh, the wells that we kept for testing. Right, um, and then we have the predictions of the para of the petrophysical parameters. Nice things as well to have in the outputs is the uncertainty of the prediction. So we'll have some predicted petrophysical uh, properties with uncertainty, as uh, so that we know that over these intervals where the uncertainty is high, uh, we could be wrong by some percentage, right? And then it can be propagated in the uh, structural model, reservoir model, while doing the simulation. So in further process, we will be considering uh, this uh, uncertainty along with other uncertainties related to measurements and so on. Uh, so uh, still in this case, so the parameters that we wanted to, uh, to predict where the porosity, uh, clay volume, total organic carbon, because uh, this was in uh, unconventional, right? Unconventional wells, reservoirs, and the water saturation. So what they've done actually, because from this set of logs, as you saw, we have the corrected gamma ray, neutron density, and uh, deep resistivity. You would say, how would we derive all these parameters and we'll be sure of this uh, reliability, reliability, even if it's an expert that is doing that. No, he did not use only that, right? Only those logs. They had some cores, uh, some advanced logs, uh, for example, spectroscopy, maybe NMR. Uh, they had other logs. The expert had other logs and they used that, those logs and core analysis data to derive the parameters Petrophysical parameters that were used to uh, to to build the ground truth, like the reference uh, based on the 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 one that the model was based on, like that from where the model was running. But in the input data of the model, we did not add the advanced logs. Why? Because still, um, again, it was a. Uh, uh, a multi-well, different well, and not all the wells were having all this data. 
data, right? So we wanted a model that will be uh, fed by only the logs that were common for all the wells, that we have response and uh, results in all the wells. So after training the uh, the model, here are the uh, the results with the uncertainty. So the tracks, we have the dense, the deep resistivity corrected to gamma ray. We have neutron density, uh, and then we have the uh, blue porosity and blue saturation total organic carbon and uh, V-clay. The blue ones are the ones that are from the ground truth, let's say, from the expert. And then we have the predicted one in pink. And the sh uh, yellow shading is the uh, uncertainty that comes as output from the, uh, from the model and the machine learning workflow. So we can... So if we think that the um, that the model uh, is just using simple logs to derive all these properties, it's quite very good because it's very close to expert output that has used other data additionally to these ones. Yeah. So here we can see that it's um, the, the benefits of this. And we would have the results in wells with minimum uh, data sets. So this is really was the objective of this, uh, of this study. And then of sure, for sure, we will have some uncertainty in some intervals, right? Uh, but still, we see that the, re the, the results from the uh, manual one and the predicted one are very close. So this shading doesn't mean that the, the difference is big. The shading means that the uncertainty, that the model is not uh, really confident about the results in those particular intervals. All good so far? Yes, I think we are good. Okay, very good. So we're reaching our, uh, I believe, our final example. Huh? So in this one, uh, uh, I left it as the uh, last one because uh, Maybe it's the most complex one. It's related to NMR. I hope that you are a bit familiar with nuclear magnetic resonance. If not, you can ask question and I can explain it uh, briefly, right? So um, in this example, we are using uh, machine learning to uh, derive porofluid distribution and phases from uh, NMR measurements. So these are the two related papers, right? Uh, so let's let's look at uh, NMR measurements. So as you as you know, I hope you know that uh, one of let's say one of the important measurements that we are uh, using in petrophysical analysis, especially when we are dealing with complex reservoirs. Uh, unconventional um, um, reservoirs who are not uh, like single, let's say, uh, single porosity in carbonates. So NMR is very is is one of the measurements that became very very important in the reservoir characterization and petrophysical analysis. Uh, so the output, the response of NMR, as you as you know, is the T2 distribution, right? Is a distribution that is um, that is uh, that looks like this. Like at each uh, depth, we will have a distribution that is related to the different component that we have at that particular depth in the formation. 
and the area that is below these lines represent the porosity. Uh, so in terms, if we want to represent this as an equation, so the total T2 distribution will be like the different volume of the different component, right? And the component, what are the components that we can have is, uh, for example, if we have, if we are in a, um, a shaly sand or an interval which has uh, some shale, or clay, we'll have some clay bound water, some capillary bound water, and we'll have like what we call the free fluid or pro producible fluid, right? Um, so we can have this one, usually we see it like this, but in reality, really, it's a sum of the uh, um, of the response of the different component that we have in the formation. So we'll have, for example, in one depth, where we have some clay and some sand, where we have some uh, uh, fluid and hydrocarbon, right? Uh, the component that we have is the bound fluid, like the clay bound water and the, uh, the capillary bound water. We have the free, uh, water, right? And we have the hydrocarbon. So three components. This is an example. We can have more, but this is a simplified example. Uh, so each component will have its own. So if we had only this amount of bound water in that formation, this volume we would have only this one in our T2 distribution, in our NMR response. If we had only this amount or this volume of free water will have only this one and same for hydrocarbon. But in reality, we have a composition of all the three. So what we see on our T2 distribution is a, a, a sum of these ones relative to the volume of each component, right? So based on this thing, this thinking, uh, Let's let's first uh, think about what we used before for what we used before NMR. Usually NMR is used for what? Porosity estimation, right? Total porosity, because the area of all this thing is porosity. Yeah. So we use NMR to estimate porosity, total porosity, fair enough. Uh, with this one, we don't have really, we don't need details about these components. It's just the sum of this, the area, that's the porosity. And then we needed to know from this porosity, which one will be produced and which one will be bound, not producible. So for that, we needed to know some cutoffs and say above this cutoff, this will be produced, this will be bound, we can't expect to produce this fluid. Knowing, uh, already knowing this cutoff is quite tricky. What we did in the past is having some core analysis uh, from samples around the, way, the world. And then we define, for example, in most of the sandstone formation, uh, the cutoff was 33 milliseconds. So above 33 milliseconds, this will be free fluid. Below, it will be bound. But this is very generic, and sometimes it, it, it did not work. For carbonates, we have all uh, uh, other cutoffs. If we wanted to know specific cutoffs in specific regions or locations or geological settings or fields, we needed to do some core analysis, right? And core analysis, we need to make sure that the cores were uh, preserved, core analysis were, were made uh, well, it takes time. So this was one of the challenges. Uh, uh, so yeah, so uh, in addition to uh, total porosity, bound fluid, free fluid, uh, from this measurement, from some equations, empirical uh, equation, we could derive permeability. So one of the other application of NMR was the estimation it was not measurement, but was estimation of the permeability. So that's how we used NMR 
in the past. Uh, with the advances of machine learning, uh, the uh, authors of these two papers that I'm citing here in the in the bottom, in the bottom, uh, were uh, working on machine learning based model that would identify the different component that we had in the T2 response, in the N uh, NMR response, right? Uh, so they will use a model that will go through all the NMR T2 distribution that we will acquire over a center interval of depth, depth interval. So how we, uh, this is how we look at uh, NMR log, right? Um, and then the model would try to identify the different component and set some cutoffs that will differentiate and separate each component, right? And then, uh, based on the uh, component and the combination of the, diff the most dominant component in each interval, we will classify, cluster and classify, right? The different interval. So we'll have uh, a clustering of the different interval and based on this also we will have the different volumes of the poro uh, fluid components so for example after identifying the different components if in one interval we'll have a lot of uh, let's say hydrocarbon component that we identified as the component represented representing um, free hydrocarbon uh, fraction, right? Uh, if the uh, interval has mostly this one, it will be classified as a high reservoir holding hydrocarbon, right? Uh, and then, based on this uh, really detailed and precise uh, volumetric estimation, we would be able to better estimate the permeability because we will have a better grasp at the different uh, fluid uh, volumes. So all this were not possible uh, without such, uh, such a model, right? Because uh, manually it's not possible to identify the different component and classify uh, and estimate the volumes, right? And then uh, this can be further ap applied to, for example, uh, uh, when doing rock typing, this can be uh, this can be helping the rock typing. Uh, process, uh, saturation height function, if you go to reservoir uh, petrophysics. So this has a lot of uh, further application uh, based on this, uh, on this type of models. So I think this was my, as I said, this was my uh, last example. I hope that um, I, I imagine that you will not grasp all the details. Uh, I put the uh, reference uh, papers. Even if in one paper, you will not have all the detail of the model and all the components, but usually you will find it in the reference of that particular paper and you can go and look for it. But I, the aim really was to give you an overview of what is being done uh, small, some example, uh, and we have a lot, a lot of more. For example, for this particular uh, permeability, which is, um, let's say, a very sensitive aspect of petrophysics, because for now, we don't have any measurements that can measure the permeability, really, right? Continuous permeability. The best, uh, the best one that we can have is, for example, the MDT, while doing uh, testing, 
and sampling or even if it's pressure tests or uh, sampling the fluids right from the formation over some points on the formation not continuous log we will have some estimation of the mobility right and we can relate this uh, with permeability and this is what was uh, what was used to compare and validate let's say so this is the closest uh, closest really that we can get to uh, permeability but we know that uh, to estimate like the potential to um, uh, simulate the production of the reservoir permeability is very important right uh, so one of the many cases that we have for machine learning really is to try to predict permeability but it needs to have good data at the beginning as we saw because training the model on something that we are not sure of it still will not get you good results. You can get any results you want, but you will not be sure of the results. So at the beginning, you will need to have some database. So uh, for example, permeability from cores or mobilities that are covering long interval and very, uh, very uh, um, uh, numerous points of a reservoir. And then you can build your... Uh, your model, this one can help as well using NMR if you have the extensive NMR data. So different approach and you can, um, and what we uh, what we can do in some cases as well is to like to um, combine all these methods to come with uh, an optimal estimation of permeability, build a model on uh, solid, reliable and enough data and then try to propagate to all the wells uh, where we have no so exten uh, extensive data but still uh, we can put some confidence on the results based on the model right uh, as conclusion what i would say and i hope that you um, sensed it through the examples that i showed and through the workflows that there is a huge potential and still we are getting uh, everyday advances on on this and we get we're getting better and better on uh, on being creative and uh, and optimizing the models that we are building in reservoir characterization and uh, workflows general workflow whether it is in uh, petrophysics or in other application right but we need to keep in mind that data science knowledge, machine learning, artificial intelligence, I know that this is very, let's say, fancy words, and especially your generation, your students, you're hearing a lot of it, and maybe you think that it is very important. Yes, it is very important, but we don't want to give it more importance than the domain knowledge, right? If you want to work still, if you want to work in the energy sector, in geoscience, in reservoir characterization, and be it for, uh, let's say, oil and gas, or now we have other applications for it, for example, CC West or geothermal, still we need to characterize characterize the subsurface, right? Uh, you need to have a good knowledge of domain, your domain. You, you want to be geophysicist, you need to know geophysics. You need to understand the formation properties, the measurements, to be able to feed your model correctly, to uh, select the right data, to QC the data input that you are uh, using to build your model. Uh, and to QC the results and to validate the model and to look at, for example, the prediction that you are getting uh, with a good assessment, right? Uh, so these are my uh, last words for you. Data science knowledge is good. This is a plus, a good uh, optional thing, but basics of domain knowledge is also is also very important and we need to keep it uh, as important as it is thank you for listening and please if you have any questions 
even if it's not directly related to what I presented, but if you have any burning question about the matter, about petrophysics, about this uh, new application, please let me know. Thank you, Miss, for your presentation. Actually, we have some questions of uh, Zekeria. Yes. Who is asking, uh, what are the most used and efficient machine learning algorithms for petrophysics? tasks like is it uh, k-means or naive base or uh, if you look at for example the examples that i uh, that i uh, showed a lot of them are using uh, random forests right uh, it's very used one uh, this and it's one of the decision trees. So decision tree uh, type of algorithm is very used in uh, in this type of application. Uh, random forest is uh, is appreciated because it's uh, account and it can um, it can highlight when we are overfitting or underfitting. Right, it, it helps doing that. Uh, but really. In every case, when you will be building your uh, machine learning model, you will have different possibilities and algorithm. And the best approach, you know, is to try a couple of them, right? Th these people have tried, I am I'm sure, have tried uh, different approaches, and then they selected the ones that made more sense for them and gave them uh, best results, yeah? So there is no one single uh, answer for that, but uh, I just shared the, um, like the general observation that I had. And in case someone is working on some cases that is approaching some um, case that uh, other people have worked on, that's the beauty of going and consulting uh, such, for example, papers. You would know what to start uh, with which with what uh, model or algorithm you, you you'll start with right you will start with the, a model that was used for a similar case and you see and then you will try another one and, and you compare and you will not limit yourself in a, in only one algorithm right okay thank you we have mm -hmm. another question we have another mm -hmm. question that is what is the approach that we should take as students to make machine learning projects in petrophysics, considering how hard it can be, especially when we're making EDAs? It will really depend on, uh, on what you will be working on, the specific data that you have, the generic approach is uh, as a, is common to all the uh, the cases, but it will really depend on uh, case by case. Try to document yourself as uh, as much as possible, like to see example and start from them for sure. Yeah, uh, but st uh, again, there is no. I I cannot think of uh, a single approach that will be good for all and petrophysics is very wide you know you can work on different uh, type of project in petrophysics for different application you can go on the preparation as we know as we saw you can go on the full petrophysical uh, evaluation you can go on uh, more geomechanical application which is quite close to the petrophysical evaluation yes you can go on uh, rock physics or seismic uh, characterization and it will depend on if you go to seismic uh, characterization maybe you will uh, you will use some seismic data so this uh, will be specific as well so really it will depend on uh, on your case but uh, try to build your approach on something that was uh, that Look at examples. That's what I what I would suggest. And there are a lot of papers out there that, like, they have detailed uh, approaches of the of uh, how they did. And start from them. Okay, thank you, Miss. 
we have two last questions. Mm -hmm. And the first one is, what, what are the major problems that machine learning is still facing in petrophysics? What are, sorry, the? What are the major major problems that machine learning are still facing in petrophysics? The problems, the challenges. Yeah, the major problems. Yeah. Uh, in petrophysics. Um. I would say trying to apply uh, machine learning programs or models in uh, in this particular environment, like on logs measurements, is challenging in itself because uh, you have some particularities, particularities. Uh, this data has, is like, um, it's not like trying to apply to uh, other type of data, like, uh, I don't know, sales data or uh, marketing data or uh, uh, data on sociology, on people behavior. So this is very different. So that's why it needs uh, a specific approach. And the um, one of the specificities is the usually the size and the variety of uh, inputs that we can have, right? And the trick is to know exactly what to take and not what to take, right? And to get the the right decision on what to choose as uh, as input to uh, to use in our model. Uh, the fitting also is one of the challenges uh, uh, and also the um, the final validation of the prediction because you can have a perfect model when you train it, when you test it and then you go and uh, use it for some other wells and it works very well but then you have an, a new well and you try to, uh, to apply your model. And if you don't have the right QC method and you don't spend enough time QC in it, if it's not handled by the model, you, go, you can go very off because maybe the well will cross an interval that was not in any of the wells that you used in the learning nor the, nor the uh, training phase, right? Because it's dealing with natural uh, formation behavior and characteristics, and it's very heterogeneous, especially in some locations and regions. Yes, so, so this is one of uh, maybe the main challenges that we, we are facing in petrophysics. I would say. Yeah, I see. And that opens the door for the next question, which is, do you need to have a lot of domain knowledge to do a future, a future about a selection before modeling? Yeah. Future selection? Sorry, what, what was the last word? Without? It was before modeling. Ah, yes. Yes. Because feature selection is one of the is the one of the first steps, right? Mm -hmm. And as I said, the this is where the uh, the domain experts is needed because if you are if you want to predict uh, uh, some fancy, let's say if you want to predict porosity, you know what are the uh, uh, what are the f features that you will uh, select but uh, sometimes if you want to have some rock typing type of uh, predictions or some things related to geology uh, in more complex or to the or for example to detect some specific minerals presence 
for example, in low resistivity pay. So this feature selection is very, very tricky because you need to know what will correlate exactly to what uh, to, to what you want to predict, right? Uh, and you need to understand the measurement that you are using, the interaction with the formation, the response. You need to understand uh, uh, the type of response that you will get. Yeah, definitely you need uh, uh, a good domain expertise. Now, if you want to predict a simple model for simple parameter and you have the data for limited so no uh, lot of choices for features. So this is fine, right? You have limited uh, possibilities. Let's say medium domain expertise is needed. But if you go into complex settings, uh, trying to predict something that is uh, not straightforward, there you will need a lot of uh, domain expertise like to select the the most suitable features, right, for your model, yeah. Okay, thank you, Miss. We have one last and inter inter interesting question, which is, uh, someone would like to inquire about the application of linear regression using PyTorch in predicting physically. Can you say it again, please? Yes, we would like to inquire about the application of linear regression using PyTorch in predicting petrophysical. Uh, linear regression has been there for a long time, right? This is one of the one of the. Uh, method that we that we had you will see when you will go and do petrophysical evaluation uh, you will have several uh, possibilities and again it depends on the complexity that the case you have if i understood what the questions right huh? if i'm if i'm answering something else just let me know but uh, um, you can you can start by simple uh, if you are facing some, for example, uh, I will uh, give you a practical example. Sometimes we are just trying to uh, predict, uh, let's say, some log responses over some few um, some few intervals over a simple lithology interval and we have some just some gaps due to a bad hole or whatever right we can do some simple uh, model linear regression as you said and try that if it gives good results we can go with it right it's okay and the, if you see the the uh, the recommendation from the um, like for the people in data science, and there are some videos that are very interesting and gives a, a good overview of uh, this type of uh, scientific approach. Um, from Google, I guess, and uh, they are available in uh, in YouTube, I, I think. Uh, they say always to start with a simple. If it doesn't work, we, ju we just go complex, right? So, for example, if we want just to uh, predict some uh, simple logs that we can, that we believe that we can derive from two other logs uh, confidently, we can do it by uh, very simple something in Excel. <laughs> Even we can do it, right? And it's still be it can be still considered as data science, right? But no machine learning uh, application. But that's that's fine. We don't need to go complex when we can go uh, simple. 
Yeah. Okay, thank you, Miss. Thank you for your clarification. And uh, there is no more questions. So I think we're going to conclude this session. So, yeah. Thank you, Miss Nisreen, for your insightful presentation on data science.